Hello everybody and welcome to the J72 Gaming Channel. My name is Jacob and you can just call me Jay here. Animalia is a creature survival game that released in early access back in September of 2021. And while it is still in early access today, I wanted to jump in and take a look at what has improved since then. At its core, this game is about picking an animal based off the African savanna. So lions, elephants, zebras, even hippos and crocodiles. And you spend your time growing to adult, finding food and water, and surviving the predators around you, which will be other players. This concept of a game, dubbed the creature survival genre, is a genre of games I am very, very familiar with. From playing hours upon hours of games like Path of Titans and The Isle, to even reviewing Animalia itself back on its early access release. These games have ups and downs, and a lot of the positives and negatives you honestly can't really get a good grasp of until you've played a creature to full adult, you've explored the map a bit, and you've really dived into the systems that are built into the game. So everybody, that's what I'm here to do today for you all. I want to take you on my journey back into this game. We're going to check out a few creatures, make sure I get one to full adult, mess around with a group of two of people, and of course, get into a few fights. And at the end of all of this, I'll make sure to wrap up the video with a pros and cons discussion. But with that all said, everybody, make sure you go sit back, kick back, and grab a snack as we take an updated look at Animalia in 2023. Let's do this. So my adventure started with taking a look at the new menus and creature creation screen, which I was pleased with at first since it already was a big upgrade from the very simple decisions we had back in 2021. But I was quickly kind of bummed out when I found out that all these sliders, they don't actually do anything, <laughs> which is it's lame, I know. But regardless, I decided to start by checking out the flyer that was available to us, the shoe bill. Now, if you guys are fans of this channel, you might already know that the flying option in these creature survival games, they're often my favorite, as it allows us to kind of check out the map. It's usually a good like tutorial creature, as you can fly away in a moment of danger. And just in general, it's a really chill choice to pick. So I went with the shoe bill, I picked a vibrant blue option, and jumped into the game. What I was immediately aware of as soon as I spawned in was that this game's map has had a ton of work done to it. Now last time I played it was a vast and open arid plains and it, it didn't really have many noteworthy locations of interest. But as I started to learn how to fly around, it became clear that the developers behind Animalia have done a bunch of work to the map. I mean, just take a look for yourself. We've got like rocky canyons, we've got oasises, oasi, I don't know. <laughs> we've got river complexes, jungles, and more. I was able to explore a good like 50% of the map I'd reckon during my six hours of playing for this review. And I will say that the map exploration was definitely one of the major highlights for me personally. Now the flying mechanics were, they were okay. Uh, you do feel like your shoe bill can gain speed when diving and that your momentum plays a role in how you control your creature, but it just lacked a bit of polish in my opinion. When I compare the shoe bill to say the Pteranodon in the Isle or the Thalassodromius in Path of Titans, the shoe bill just lacks a bit of the finesse and precise movements you're able to do with the other games. But overall, it was alright. I ended up playing the shoe bill for about an hour or so, learning the basic mechanics of the games, like how you can press Q to sniff for food and water, something that we will see a ton of later in this video, and uh, also learning that this game has stats that you can invest into your creature. Now the stat mechanic I want to spend some time on explaining to you guys, since it really is the main system in this game that differentiates it from other creature survival games. Over time, as you grow, you will get stat points every few minutes or so. It's pretty neat, honestly, as it allows you to focus on what you want out of your creature. For example, if you want to play a solo creature that roams the map, you may want to put more stats into stamina so you can run farther, or into HP and armor so you have a greater chance to survive an attack. Or you may be in a lion pack and want to build a glass cannon creature with all your points into attack so you can hit like an absolute truck. The flexibility the stats allow is pretty neat. Well, on paper at least. Because if you do end up playing the game a lot, you may start to notice that the meta for this game is really attack and stamina. Because once you get into a fight, those are by far the most worthwhile stats to invest into. But alas, this is not really a problem with the idea or system itself, but more a reflection on the players and their constant drive to be the alpha creature in Animalia and in fights. With time and some more balancing to the game, I'm sure these pain points can be softened, and who knows? 
The meta someday may shift to being a rhino with full armor and HP, or even a crocodile that has the stamina of a marathon runner. So after playing the shoe bill for a bit, I wanted to get my feet dirty, uh, quite literally, and step into the body of a terrestrial animal. I was interested in the meerkat, simply because it was not a creature available uh, to play last time, and I was hoping that there would be a cool burrow mechanic. Sadly, at, at least as far as I was able to find out in my own time in the game, there didn't seem to be that much I could do in that regard. Plus, I was pretty sure that the most interesting way to play a meerkat was to join a large group, right? Nesting in players to create a large society of meerkats, which I do think could be fun. But as a solo player, I was just kind of a small, slow, and easy target to eat. <laughs> so I swapped creatures again to one I ended up playing for a good five hours. Introducing the hippo. Now I absolutely love hippos, and they have always been one of my favorite animals, so knowing that I'd be playing a creature to full adult, I wanted to pick one that I thought I would enjoy for the whole adventure. Plus, I assumed being a big, bulky hippo would be to my advantage as I grew as a solo player. Which it was, actually. So I set off, prioritized sticking to the rivers and streams of the African safari, uh, my eyes keen and aware for lions and the constant potential for a lurking crocodile in the rivers I was swimming in. Now guys, this is where I need to be a little bit honest with you guys about the growth in this game. If you are familiar with the Isle, the one I'm going to be talking about will be extremely relatable for you, as the growth in this game feels almost identical to the experience of playing the Legacy version of the Isle. Mainly this. The only thing to do while growing is to find food and water. That's it. There's no diet system to hunt for, there's no quests or tasks to complete for rewards. Nope. Just simply spending the time, being safe, and searching for your next meal. Now some people are going to love this, and I will admit I'm occasionally one of them. Only having to hunt for food allows you to be really immersed with your creature, as you are going to be spending a lot of time with them just simply walking, hiding in bushes, sniffing for the next meal, and making smart tactical decisions on where to migrate to and live. But... I think it's safe to say that the majority of players would really appreciate some sort of gameplay loop during the growth stage. I'll touch upon this more in the pros and cons, but only having to stay safe as the main objective on your way to adult, well it ultimately looks like this. Yeah, lots and lots of waiting and lots and lots of hiding. <laughs> now I'm not gonna lie, I have AFK'd for a good two hours or so on and off with my hippo to get it to become an adult. And I did get bored enough that I actually called it a day and logged off just to complete my growth the next day. But this is where the story improves a bit and fun was just around the corner. The next day I logged on with Two objectives. Number one, try to find a group of players, other hippos, to group with and experience the game in a herd. Actually, it's a bloat of hippos, <laughs> but a herd nonetheless. I know from my time playing the Isle Legacy that this is easily the most fun you will have in the game, as it is best experienced in a herd surviving or as a pack hunting. So I set off away from my safe haven of the jungle where I had grown for those three hours the previous day as a sub adult halfway to full adult. And this is where I get to introduce the legend that is Brian the Hippo. As I was wandering the savannas of Animalia, I saw in the global chat that a hippo group was forming up, and I asked if I could join. And I was invited to the group with another sub-adult hippo named Brian and a young juvenile hippo named Miss Sassy. Once I met up with them, a storm actually started to roll in, and Brian let us know that it was actually a mechanic in the game revolving around water. Basically, rivers will form or evaporate based off rainfall, droughts, and even snow. Snow! In the safari! <laughs> now, I thought it was odd, but kind of funny, and I did actually see snow when flying around on the shoe bill the previous day, so it wasn't a huge shock, but to know that it plays a dramatic effect on where water is on the map is a very cool thing to hear, and definitely worth mentioning as even some of the leading creature survival games have not pulled off water mechanics quite like this yet. So bravo on that, Animalia. Now Brian let us know that he had played a decent bit of Animalia, so he became our resident expert in our small herd, and that because of the storm that had blown in, we were actually all getting cold, because temperature, it seemed, also played a large role in the game. 
Another unique system hiding deep in this game that you would normally not really think about at first glance. Brian told us that to stay warm we could either find shelter or huddle together for warmth, which, besides being absolutely adorable with baby Miss Sassy, was a nice realism touch to the game. I mentioned that I had actually seen a cave on my way to meet up with the group, and it wasn't that far away, so we headed out and took shelter from the storm in there. The cave even had a small pond to drink from, and some food for us to graze on, so it was a peaceful time hanging out, chatting about the game, and weathering out the storm. Once the storm passed, we set out for a place Brian called the Oasis, which obviously sounded lovely, <laughs> but he did warn us that this was a more popular place on the map, but because both him and I were full adult hippos at this point, we stood a good chance against anything wanting to snack on Miss Sissy. On the way, we picked up another player named Lexicat, who was yet another juvenile hippo, so Brian and I definitely had our hands full as far as who we needed to protect now. So let's take a moment now and talk about how growth works in this game. Like I mentioned earlier, there is no mechanic in the game that allows you to grow faster. However, once you meet a certain threshold, you're able to click growth in your menu, and this will advance you to the next stage in your life, from newborn to juvenile to sub-adult and finally to adult. Brian did tell me, however, that there are actually two more stages. There's an elder stage at the end of your adult, and at the end of elder stage, there is an apex stage. However, only specific genders of specific creatures, species, can achieve apex, which makes sense from a realism point of view. For example, only female elephants can become the matriarchs, male lions become pride leaders, and unfortunately for me and Brian, only female hippos can become the apex. And both of us were playing male hippos. RIP. Regardless though, we met up with Lexi and made it to the Oasis, where, finally, we started to see other players. There were a few lion scares as we saw them off in the distance, and there was a kamikaze hyena that essentially dove into Brian's mouth and got absolutely deleted off of the Animalia Safari. <laughs> Just poof, gone. I'm, I'm not sure what he was thinking. <laughs> But we ended up just kind of doing hippo things for a while, basking in the sun, wallowing in the oasis, and generally hanging out as Lexi and Sassy continue to grow up. There was a moment when a tiny crocodile showed up, which was easily scared off, and we did also see two juvenile giraffes who seemed a bit hesitant to approach us, uh, but warmed up to us in the end. Now we were hanging out at this oasis for a good amount of time. Eventually Lexi had a log off, and we ended up gaining another member of the herd named 24-7, who, uh, he was around, to say the least. <laughs> More I am in a bit. But this is around the time when things really started to become active around the Oasis. An absolute massive crocodile showed up, and I really thought a fight was going to break out, um, so I went to go protect one of our baby hippos, but, um, well, I'll just let the footage speak for itself. Oh, they just logged out. Okay, that's lame. Well, bummer. So yeah, players are still gonna combat log, it seems. <laughs> so, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, after the croc left, there was a few more run-ins with predators. Uh, a lion started to eyeball our young hippos, but I was able to chase him off, which felt pretty empowering as a, as a, you know, adult hippo. Um, and as long as he didn't come back with a pack, we should be all right. There was also this cheeky leopard who uh, ended up attacking me during a moment when Brian actually got disconnected. Uh, the fight was short and he easily ran away, but I did manage to get a few bites in, um, so another easily fended off predator. After this though, things got real quiet for a while. 24-7 and Miss Sassy ended up just kind of AFKing and we actually never heard from either of them again, so getting bored and wanting to find a fight, Brian and I ended up taking off on the great hippo adventure of 2023. We set off for this place called Pride Rock, which is a well-known location in the game that Brian was sure people would be at. Unfortunately for us, during this long adventure, the server was actually hosting an event, a baby battle royale, they called it, uh, which it was great to see as having an active server with community events is always fun, but it did have the unfortunate side effect for Brian and I that no one was really roaming the world uh, as they were all at the event. So our adventure took us away from the oasis, through a river canyon which was honestly really really gorgeous looking and probably the most impressive looking area of the map that I've seen so far. 
It also took us up to the Mountain of Pride Rock. But, like I mentioned, not a soul could be found. Once the event concluded, however, a chance for a fight appeared for us. The server admins asked if anybody wanted to be teleported to the Oasis. Back to our hippo oasis. <laughs> and all we needed to do was type TP in the chat. And seeing no better way to find other players, Brian and I accepted. And well, as you can expect, we found a ton of other players who also accepted that TP. We quickly joined up with another adult hippo who had taken that TP yeah, named Cuddy. Uh, and all around us were lions, wildebeests, leopards, crocodiles, hyenas, man, you name it, it was there. So, we all know where this is headed, right? <laughs> Roll the inevitable fighting clip. Oh, we got a fight. There it is. There it is. All broke out. I'm gonna go for this one. Come here, buddy. Here's the combat I was waiting for. It's chaos. It's chaos. But like, I don't even know. I'm just fighting everybody. <laughs> Now, the fight lasted for a good five minutes or so, and it was pretty much a stalemate from the get-go. The lions didn't really want to commit to attacking us since there were three fully adult hippos. Like, I don't really blame them, right? So they kept their distance for the most part, and eventually we were able to defend ourselves, and the lion pack backed off and just kind of abandoned the hunt. So Brian, Khalid, and I were able to swim back to our oasis spot to live another day. So which I figured was a good place to hop on, as I now had a much better understanding of the game, and I also had about six hours of footage to edit down. <laughs> so, with all that adventuring out of the way, folks, let's go ahead and dive into what makes this game good, and what holds it back just a bit. Time for the pros and cons. Alright all, so the first good thing about this game that I want to talk about is the map. It really is a huge upgrade from when I last checked out the game in 2021. There are plenty of noteworthy landmarks and biomes to explore, and the map was large enough that I didn't even see the entirety of it with my time playing the game. And I even flew around as the shoe build, so that's impre pretty impressive. <laughs> now there are still a few large vast open areas without much detail that could use at least a bit of ground foliage, but overall I was pleased with the map, so it's a pro for me. The next pro, and this is a pretty big one, is the stat system in the game. Again, this is really what makes Animalia so unique when compared to all the other creature survival games on the market right now. Being able to customize your creature the way you want to is really cool. And even if the meta has a tendency to maximize attack and stamina, balancing over time can help alleviate it. Or you can just do your own thing. I mean, when I played the Hippo, I actually had put most of my points into HP and armor, and those lions did absolutely nothing to me so it seemed like a good choice ultimately for me so yeah stats and animalia get a thumbs up for me animalia has a very decent selection of creatures to choose from and since i did not list them all or show them in the video let me read off the full list for you guys real quick for carnivores there's the lion leopard crocodile hyena shoebill and wild dog meerkat is the option for omnivores and for herbivores, we have giraffe, wildebeest, elephant, hare, zebra, hippopotamus, gazelle, and rhino. So you can already see, there were a few species we didn't even bump into in the video, and that's exciting as far as diversity goes in the gameplay, and replay value as far as trying all the different options. Populations of the servers also seemed large enough for interactions, at least on the server I was on. There seemed to always be at least a few servers with 40 plus players on, and some were even reaching up to 100 players during like peak times. So it's good to see that the game is still thriving. Plus, some servers are hosting events and interacting with the player bases, like the Baby Battle Royale event that took place on the server I played on, which by the way, was called From the Ashes. Now the next pro I think is actually a pretty big one, and that's how weather affects the waterways of the map. Rainfall creating new ponds or rivers filling up, and droughts causing them to recede and evaporate is an extremely complex system that really adds a lot of immersion to the gameplay. And like I said earlier in the video, even some of the leading creature survival games have not yet implemented a system like this into their game, so it really does deserve a commendable praise for this. Another great thing in this game is the scent feature. 
specifically that you leave a yellow trail behind you that predators can use to track and hunt. Being able to use the scent to see where your food and water are all, it's great and all, right? But when you play a game like, say, Path of Titans, and you don't have a way to hunt actively as a predator, besides visually seeing your prey, well, it can get kind of rough. But being able to constantly stop, to sniff, and then having that exciting moment where you see a yellow trail of a previously passed animal, it's really important to the carnival playstyle. I'm glad to see it in the game already, even if we didn't really get to test it out fully as the hippo. And the last pro is that they have apex growth available, and although you need to be the right gender for it, uh, I made this a positive due to the realism and immersion of the choice. Uh, but it could be considered a con, so it's kind of here at the end of pros. <laughs> but being rewarded for playing a creature to the very end and having survived all the way to adult and then to elder and then finally apex, it's a pretty cool way to reward the players and apparently they also look a whole lot cooler too. Alright, now it's time to talk about some of the cons of the game. So first and foremost, and I think this is by far, guys, the biggest problem with the game right now, and that's the lack of a gameplay loop. Now what do I mean by this? So I touched upon this earlier in the section where I was growing my hippo, um, but not having anything to do while growing other than simply finding food and water, it really makes the growth system of this game pretty boring. Now, the Isle of Rima have solved this issue by giving players a diet system. This system allows the player bonus growth and stat changes based off the food that they eat. And the types of food creatures need to eat are spread all over the map, which encourages movement across the map and thus fueling player interactions as the map is populated across the different biomes. In Path of Titans, they went a completely different route with their gameplay loop, and they have quests that the creatures need to complete in order to gain growth, as well as marks that are eventually used to purchase things like new attacks and abilities and skins. What both of these games have done is that they have offered the players choices during growth, and I really cannot understate the importance of this. Without a good gameplay loop of decision making, the players will end up sitting around, likely in bushes, hiding and just waiting until they are large enough and safe enough to finally explore the map. Now obviously grouping up in a pack or a herd will help alleviate this problem as the larger players do get to spend their time protecting the group, but I think my reason still stands. This is easily the biggest con of this game, and that's why I'm talking about it much longer than the other pros and cons. For me personally, Animalia really needs to decide how they're going to fix this issue. A diet system like the Isle of Rima is likely the easiest way to fix this, but I think they could also think of a completely unique way to get the players up and about in their world. Maybe an achievement system to explore the map and find different foods, or a growth bonus when you drink new fresh water after a storm. Heck, maybe even a little growth bonus for finding another player of your species and having an interaction. I'm not sure. There are plenty of interesting ways this game's growth can be improved. But where it stands now, it's the single biggest reason I don't really see myself playing this game as often as other creature survival games. Combat is still without collision. And while I do know that some people actually prefer this type of gameplay, one that is akin to the Isle Legacy, for me personally, being able to phase through other creatures is really off-putting. And it makes combat really just a game of turning and tail riding or giving fast creatures the advantage of just zooming through and biting as they pass. This is a bummer, since really, combat and protecting yourself from predators is ultimately the end game of Animalia. Fights will happen. Fights will be seeked out. And when combat lacks collisions, fights will also tend to be a bit lackluster. Okay, just a few more cons here. I wanted to mention that the shoe bill flying I thought was, it was a bit subpar. Like, it was okay, like I mentioned earlier, uh, but it was just, it lacked a bit of finesse that I would have loved to see. And as someone who loves the flying creatures in survival games, well, I don't see myself wanting to play Shoebill anymore, since flying around wasn't really, well, <laughs> it wasn't really fun. Kind of clunky mess that just worked. Another quick con is that holding E to drink and eat was sometimes a bit of a chore, where your creatures just didn't start drinking or eating, uh, forcing you to reposition your animal in the hopes that next time you push E, your character would actually do the thing that you asked your character to do. <laughs> Other creature survival games also have this issue too, so it's a small con, um, but it's still annoying nonetheless. 
And the last con, everybody, that needs to be mentioned is that this game crashed for me three times during my six hours of gameplay. Now, this wasn't a server disconnect. No, this was a full-on game crash, which is frustrating to see, and I hope that they continue work on optimization and stability a bit to alleviate this. All right, everybody, there we have the pros and cons of Animalia. If I was to summarize all of my thoughts of this game into one concise statement and review, here you go. Animalia is a promising creature survival game with unique weather systems, stat allocations, tons of species choices, and apex growth rewards that is only held back by a lack of gameplay loop during the growth stages, as well as an old school, outdated, phase through style combat system, albeit in an expansive and interesting African safari map. I hope this review helped you all get a bit more understanding of where Animalia stands here in 2023. And if you enjoyed this video, please like and comment down below what you think about this game. As it stands now, it is easily the best creature survival game that we have based around real creatures from Africa. And I would recommend the game for folks who enjoy that slower based, arguably old school style combat akin to the Isle Legacy. And I would advise folks who want a bit more to do during the many hours it takes to grow, maybe check back into the game in a year or so to see if they have made changes that help that part of the game be a bit more engaging. But that's it for me, folks. If you guys enjoyed what you saw here today in this review, I welcome you to subscribe to join the Sauropod Squad here on YouTube. And if you'd like even more content from me, feel free to become a member below to join our Sauropod captains who get two extra videos each month. Also, feel free to join the Discord if you'd like to join our community and chat about all these games we like and play. But until next time, everybody, I have been Jay, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Peace.